My fellow physicists, today we are going to do an example with Huygens construction. Here's our problem. A cork is bobbing up and down sinusoidally in the middle of a lake, emitting a circular wave with a wavelength of one meter. Show that you can numerically recreate the circular wave by doing a Huygens construction along a line four meters from the cork. So what we have is we have this cork that's bobbing up and down here, and it's emitting these circular waves. All right, well, this is on a lake. Okay, now what does that, what does that wave look like mathematically? Well, it's a sine wave, as you can see over here. All right, alpha is just some constant that tells us how big it is. All right, and it's a sine wave, and the phase of our sine wave depends on time. It evolves in time, and it depends on where we are. It doesn't depend on x or or y alone. It depends on a combination of the two that says how far we are away from the quark. Right, so it's k, the wave number, times how far away we are r. Now notice that our wave's amplitude drops as the square root of r. Why is that? Well, in three dimensions, if I have a spherical wave, we think about the power coming from the source, from the, you know, whatever it is that's making the wave, gets spread over, as it spreads out, it spreads over bigger and bigger spheres. The surface area of a sphere goes as the radius squared. So we would expect then the intensity of our wave goes down as one over the radius squared because we're spreading that power over a bigger and bigger area. If the intensity goes down as one over r squared, remember the intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared, so the amplitude is proportional to the square root of the intensity. So if the intensity of a spherical wave goes down as one over r squared, the amplitude goes down as one over r. Well now let's go down into two dimensions. All right, in a two-dimensional circular wave, the power is spread out over bigger and bigger circles. The circumference of a circle is proportional to the radius of the circle. So the two-dimensional intensity should go down as one over r. The amplitude goes down as the square root of that, so the amplitude should go down as one over the square root of r. All right, now when r is equal to zero, this goes to infinity, all right? So you can't really talk about your circular or your spherical wave right at the center. We'll just have some constant here that tells us how big it is, you know, some distance away, all right? Now in this derivation, I'm not gonna worry a whole lot about amplitudes, absolute amplitudes. I just wanna make sure that when I do my Huygens construction, all of the sources that I add together have the, have the right relative amplitude, all right? Now, first a caveat, it turns out that Huygens principle isn't actually absolutely true in two dimensions like it is in three dimensions, but it's true enough for the examples that we're going to do in this class. It's easier for us to plot two-dimensional plots than three-dimensional ones on the computer. So we'll do two-dimension, and Huygens is good enough uh, for what we're doing, all right? Now, um, also, when we do our Huygens construction, what we're, what we're doing is we're saying, I have this wave right here that's being made by this cork, but instead of thinking over here, you know, this I'm getting this wave because the cork is making it, I can think I'm getting some ripple here because the water's rippling along this line, right? So the cork makes the water ripple along this red line four meters away from the cork. And then the rippling of the water on this line makes secondary waves that come out and generate everything downstream. Now, really you say, oh, this is happening because the cork is making it happen. But you can kind of think about it either way. Either, you know, it's happening because of the cork, or you can sort of think the cork is making the water ripple along here. And then I can think of the little ripples along this line as just a sum of an infinite sum of little infinitesimal point sources all adding together to make my wave here. Now we're going to do this numerically on the computer, so we will not have an infinite sum of infinitesimal point sources. We're going to just have a finite sum of lots of point sources that we'll add together. And once again, I'm not going to worry about the absolute amplitude. We just want to see that we recreate the features of the wave. Okay, so um, this is the wave I'm trying to reproduce by adding together all of these little point sources, all right? So the idea is I'm gonna have these point sources, right? So here's my wave coming out, and I'm gonna say four meters away, I'm gonna make an array of little point sources that are all emitting little circular waves, and they're all gonna add together and hopefully reproduce the wave from this one point, that from our cork, downstream, all right? But to know how to add these waves together, I have to know what the wave is doing at any given point. So I look at this point right here, I'm gonna make a source, I'm gonna have an emitter, right, that makes waves from each of these. I'm gonna look at this little emitter. How big should this emitter be oscillating compared to that one? Well, it just depends on how big the waves from the quark are at this point compared to at this point, all right? And what phase will this 
wave be oscillating at relative to this source right here? Once again, it depends on the phase of the wave coming from the cork here versus here. So I'm gonna call this distance L. Remember, L is four meters. I'm gonna go out to this point right here. I'm gonna call the height of this source right here y sub s, right? And then each, I have a different y sub s for each of these sources I'm going to add together, all right? Now, when I figure out what the source, what the quark wave is doing at this point, it depends on how far away that point is. But this distance right here, right there, of course, is just the square root of L squared plus Y source squared, all right? So here's the wave I'm trying to reproduce. And if I look at some point along that line where I'm gonna add a whole bunch of points together to try and reproduce that wave, the wave at that point is just going to look like this, right? Where r is just the square root of l squared plus y squared. So the square root of r is l squared plus y squared to the 1 fourth power, right? And then I've got sine of kr, but r is just, the, again, the square root of l squared plus y squared, okay? So that's what this wave is doing at the point where I'm gonna put this little source, all right? And I'm gonna add all these sources together. But if I look at any particular source, this is what the wave is doing at that source, which means I need to have that source producing a circular wave, kind of like this one right here, but its origin will be offset. And we're going to scale the amplitude by the amplitude of the quark wave right here. So I'll scale the amplitude with this thing right here. And there will be a phase shift of that wave that looks like this. So um, when I want to write then the wave coming from just that one source along my line, I'll use these amplitudes and this amplitude and phase, the amplitude to scale it and this phase to offset the phase of it. I'm also going to use this parameter q, all right, just to simplify my life. So I have my source right here, and I hit the, this point four meters away, and I look at this point right here. All right, when I add all of my little waves together, I'm going to say, what's happening at this point right here? Well, I'm going to add all these little waves right here to find out what happens here, all right? Well, once I have my amplitude and my phase shift for this point, then I'm going to have this circular wave coming from this point, and what's happening here due to this po source right here, or to this source right here, right, depends on how far away this point is I'm looking at from that source, all right? And so Q is going to be this distance from, as I go through and sum up these sources, for any given source, Q is the distance from the source to then where I'm going to measure the wave, all right? And so if I measure the wave at some position X and Y, and my source has some displacement Y sub S in this direction, all right, then this distance Q is just the square root of X minus L squared, right? Because this distance is X and this distance is L plus Y minus Y source, because here is say Y for this point right there, but I have to subtract off the distance to the source because I want this distance Q, all right? So with those definitions, I can write the wave due to one source of my Huygens construction as this amplitude that I defined divided by the square root of the distance from the source to where I'm measuring the wave, times sine of k times the distance from that source in my Huygens construction to where I'm measuring the point, minus omega t, and then I have to add in the phase shift for that one source along the line. And then to get the total function, I just add all of these sources. Now, once again, in a real Huygens construction, this should be an integral. There's an infinite number of infinitesimal sources. But for our numerical experiment, we're just going to add a bunch of point sources close enough together that hopefully we can simulate the wave from our quark. All right? So I'm summing all of these waves. And these waves are a function of x and y. Oh, and they're a function of time, too. I didn't put t in here. All right? But they're also a function of where did I, where is this particular source? And so. I'm summing from n equals minus some number to some number, and I'm going to space them a distance delta y apart, all right? And then I add all of these sources together, and hopefully I get something that looks like my original wave from my quark. Here's the Mathematica code that I did. So first of all, up here, I define L to be equal to 4, so I can type L instead of 4, all right? And my wave number, remember I said the wavelength of these waves is uh, 1 meter, so k is just 2 pi radians per meter, all right? Now I'm going to forget about time. I'm just going to plot these waves at time t equals zero and see what the wave crests look like at time t equals zero. You could put time in and plot them at different times, but just for simplicity, I'm just going to set time equal to zero. All right, now the amplitude of this source, right, is basically the amplitude of the 
wave that I started, or the, the wave from the quark, all right? And the distance from the quark is the square root of L squared plus Y squared, right? And then remember the amplitude going from the quark up to this point where I'm gonna generate then my secondary wave, all right? Um, that drops off as one over R squared, so this ends up as being one over this thing to the one fourth power, all right? So there's my amplitude. Here's the phase shift the, of that source right there, all right? And then I define this parameter Q just to make it easier. Q is the distance from this point source, which was excited, you know, which is driven by the wave from the quark. And then that's, I'm gonna come down to some position x, y, and see what the wave's doing, all right? And the contribution from this source depends on that distance q from the source back to, from this the source, which is one of my Huygen construction sources, right, along this line to the point where I'm measuring it. And then, once again, I just define the wave that I get from one of these sources along my line. I have all these different sources. The, the, the wave from one of them is a function of x, y, and how far up that source is, which source it is, all right? And there's an amplitude, and then it drops off with Q, and then it's sine of K times Q plus the phase shift. And again, I'm setting time equal to zero. And then to get the total wave, I just sum all of these sources. So I'm gonna sum from N equals negative some number to some number. I'm gonna add all these sources, and I'm going to space them by some distance dy, okay? So let's see what happens when I add all of them up. So up here is the original wave from the quark, right? I just plotted uh, one single spherical wave or circular wave coming from the quark. And here I'm plotting my Huygens construction, but I've summed only over zero, all right? So there's only one source. So I'm trying to emulate this wave by adding one source. It doesn't emulate it very well. This doesn't look very much like that, all right? But let's add in some more sources. So here I have three sources, each spaced by a meter and I add them all together, it still doesn't look much like that, all right? Well, here's a bunch more sources. So here I have, uh, I go from minus five to five, so that's 11 sources, and now they're closer together. They're not a meter apart, they're 0.2 meters. So they're 0.2 times the wavelength apart, and this is starting to look more like the wave we started with. If I add in even more sources, so here's 51 sources going from minus 25 to 25, spaced by 0.2 meters, I add them all together and I get something that looks an awful lot like the wave I started with. So my Huygens construction is working. However, note that my Huygens construction only works downstream from my surface, right? In this direction, right, it's like the wave is propagating backwards. So if I have all these oscillating point sources, it'll make a wave propagating backwards, which isn't what happens, right? This wave from my quark is propagating in that direction. So something to be aware of in your Huygens constructions is they only propagate time forwards. You can actually propagate them backwards. Maybe I should have made a plot of this, but if I take all of these phases here and I invert, I let time run backwards, you can actually get a wave here that is not correct over here, but looks like a wave focusing down to my quark. So there's cool things you can do with Huygens construction. If you measure what's happening everywhere on a surface, you can make the oscillations go backwards and actually focus the wave back and see what source was creating the wave. But that's not what we did here. What we did is we showed that by adding together a whole bunch of point sources along here with the correct amplitudes and phase, we were able to reproduce the wave from our quark, which was, you know, over here. All right, there you have it.